This module on the general section of um, non-isolated DC-DC converters is going to address the additional innovation of using synchronous rectifiers in the switching uh, elements in the power stage. And that's easily explained with this first slide, which shows, which compares the uh, power switch configuration that we have been talking about on the left, in, um, uh, uh, in, in enclosed with the red box, is the, the pulse width modulating switch, which we're controlling with the pulse width signal, as we've already described. And you see the freewheeling diode, also shown in red, which is necessary because the output inductor is going to always have current flowing through it, and we have to have a path for that, whether the power switch is conducting or open. Now, that circuit has been very useful and, and productive in many, many power supplies, particularly at higher voltage levels, where the implications of the, of the diode were minimal. Diode's a pretty simple device, and it only has a half to seven-tenths of a volt of uh, forward drop, and that was a fairly small amount of loss compared to the output voltage um, in most common circuits of the day. But as output voltages got lower and MOSFET technology got better, we were able to build power MOSFETs which, when fully enhanced, would have a voltage drop that would be substantially less at the same equivalent current than a diode. So these became a very significant um, addition to our circuits by replacing the diode that was shown externally there in red on the left with another power MOSFET shown in green on the uh, right-hand schematic. Now the implications of this are that we do in fact have to have two gate drive signals because we have to operate those switches alternately. We can't have them both on at the same time or that would short the input voltage right to ground. But we can configure it so that when we turn that um, power MOS switch, the synchronous rectifier that replaces the diode, it is the RDS on, the drain source resistance of the fully enhanced FET that provides the voltage droppers um, of that device, and that can be now as little as eight hundredths of an ohm today's, with today's technology. Uh, if we compare these two circuits with a typical example, as you can see up at the top, it says this is a 24-volt input, 5-volt output, 2.5-amp uh, output current um, DC to DC converter. A typical diode FET a diode uh, uh, over on the left-hand side, even going to a Schottky diode, would still have at least a half a volt and maybe upwards of a volt if it was at higher voltage beyond that within a Schottky capability. And if you then look at the power dissipation in that device all by itself, that's shown in the equation below where it is the diode voltage times the output current during the period where the output current is flowing through that diode, in other words, the off time of the switch, with a duty cycle of approximately um, whatever it would be with this uh, step down from 24 volts down to, uh, to uh, 5 volts, 20%, uh, I guess, uh, the output power of this just, that's dissipated just in that diode alone was just slightly under 1 watt. Now that's one watt loss in this circuit where the total load of the circuit is only uh, 12 and a half watts. So it's a substantial limitation. When we went to this 80 milliohm RDS on FET as a synchronous rectifier, everything else be remaining the same, uh, the power dissipation is less than half of what the diode would be. And that has uh, very dramatic implications when we did a thermal plot of the of the uh, PC board with the, rect with the entire regulator on it, you could see that there was a 30 degree C temperature gradient or de temperature differential just caused by the savings in switching from a discrete diode to a power MOSFET. So the benefits are very significant here. First of all, the conductive losses are much less. Uh, the, we can actually build this uh, power MOSFET uh, smaller, and we can integrate it into our um, integrated circuit more readily to make an overall solution 
with a size implication that is, offers significant benefits. And of course, the lower RDS on, which re results in lower power losses, reduces the temperature rise. Now, there are some challenges with this. I mentioned earlier that we do have to have a separate gate drive signal, but it is ground reference, so at least it's easier to implement. It's just the inverse of the, of the drive um, of, the, um, of the main power switch, although we do need to make sure that there is at least some slight dead band, dead band when both switches are off because we can't allow both switches to be on. So typically there'll be a small increment of time when both switches are on, but um, that represents a, a very small portion of the overall uh, period. There could be possible uh, re issues with the MOSFET diodes recovery time, but in, again, in integrated form, we're able to compensate for that very neatly, and the user of the device does not um, suffer any because of it. One other issue which is a user concern, and that is a power MOSFET, when it's in this application and you turn it on, it will conduct current in both directions. And we'll show that in a minute. In fact, I think the next slide shows that. Here you see the comparison of the DC to DC converter with the freewheeling diode on the left, and on the right we've replaced that diode with a synchronous rectifier MOSFET. Now at fairly uh, any reasonable load range, what we're plotting in these plots is load current as a function of time. Um, and we're actually showing the inductor current that is flowing by the action of the pulse width modulation, where it is, it is uh, the amplitude of that is determined by the average current that's required by the output. And at some uh, higher than minimal load currents, those waveforms are, look exactly the same, and they are exactly the same, regardless of whether you have the diode or the FET. But as you go to lower load demands, as that upper waveform begins to fall down towards zero, uh, when you have a diode, you could get to the point where the inductor current goes to zero and would want to go in a reverse direction now, but the rectifier won't allow that to happen. So at that point in time, the circuit just stops dead. There's no more current in the output inductor, and everything waits until the next pulse when you start up again. So that means the next pulse has got to be a little bit higher because you've got no energy delivered to the output during that period of time. But that, that usually isn't much of a loss because this only occurs when the output load demand is less than one half of the peak-to-peak inductor current waveform, and you begin to get that clipping on the bottom. Now the power MOSFET will conduct in both directions, so it has no problem at all under light load conditions for letting the inductor current actually go negative, and you see that uh, showing the same peak-to-peak -peak triangular waveform. There's good and bad issues with that. The good issue is that it means that there's always continuous current flowing in the inductor, and that means the loop dynamics remain continuous, where if you let the inductor current go to zero, the compensation um, it, it, it falls apart and uh, you have very low, very poor response for that portion of the cycle. But the, one of the concerns that we have to worry about is if we were trying to start up this circuit into a system that already had output voltage on the output terminals of the regulator, we might have a problem because normally when you start up a, a switching regulator, you start with very low um, uh, pulse widths and then you let with some time constant the pulse width expand until whatever pulse width requirement you have to uh, regulate the output voltage. So this, the starting waveforms have a very narrow pulse width. Well, a very narrow pulse width means that the off time is very long. And with a very long time, we could get negative current then that would flowing, pulling current from the output circuit back to ground and probably keeping the, uh, uh, this regulator from even starting up. So when we use synchronous rectifiers with the potential for output biasing, we have to make sure that we uh, blank the, uh, the, the synchronous rectification during the initial startup point. But that's an easy thing to correct in the controller. So these, uh, or this, these waveforms shown here on the left 
illustrate three different modes of operation. Uh, we've called, and we, we, de we um, define them by the way in which the current is flowing in the inductor. Uh, the upper one is constant current mode, CCM, which means constant inductor current. And this is pulse width modulation, and it could be either voltage mode control or current mode control. It's fixed frequency, and you can see the action of the switch on the upper waveform, S1, um, and then when it uh, is terminated, then we activate the synchronous rectifier, which is the waveform shown as S2, and you can see how that affects the current in the inductor, ramping up with the switch and ramping down with the synchronous rectification. Now, we could implement that circuit with discontinuous current mode, which was um, uh, DCM, discontinuous conductor mode, and that's shown in the middle waveforms, and you can see the issue there is uh, we've still got the same ramping up of inductor current when the power switch is on, but now when the synchronous rectifier conducts and we block it, um, the, the, the uh, current goes to zero, and it is held... Um, we have terminated the synchronous rectifier driving signal, and so there is no current flow, and we have a period of dead time, and that's discontinuous mode. And then the third mode is pulse frequency modulation, or PFM, and this is for, even, for good efficiencies with even lighter load currents. And here you see we've, we're doing this on a pulse-by-pulse pulse basis where we have um, activated the switch, S1, current is ramped up, then we terminate the power switch, activate the synchronous rectifier, current ramps down, and now we're going to just wait. And this is what uh, that uh, constant on time circuit would do. We just wait until there was a demand for more output current. So this could conceivably go to much lower switching frequencies, but also provide much greater efficiencies at light loads. So the same basic circuit can be implemented in three different modes here with three different operating characteristics. So that's, uh, that's the story on synchronous rectifier, uh, using synchronous rectifiers and switching regulators. And we will go on with the next module to talk about designing some of the extra components we haven't talked about yet, the filter components and the capacitors.